We just start? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, I'm in. Um, so I apologize. I was, my name is Jacob Gerges, by the way, if anyone who hasn't uh, seen me or heard me or anything like that. Um, so I serve at St. John, uh, like Abuna said. <laughs> so um, uh, just pray for us. <laughs> so um, Abuna asked me to kind of uh, to give a, a talk maybe in a two-parter can you guys hear me in the back do i have to go this way okay sorry actually i'm just getting over a cold so i can't hear myself so i'm i sound louder in my head than i do outside probably but um i watched uh the youtube last week and i, I saw peter actually gave an, a good introduction on um fasting uh and that's actually kind of what i want to talk about and i felt because i was when i was researching topics to figure out what to talk about. I think fasting, while such a, you know, you know over-talked talk, uh, we still don't really grasp it and fully understand it from an orthodox perspective, I think, you know. And, and I think for myself, if I don't understand something, I don't, I, I usually, I'm not, my heart's not in it. I'm not inclined to keep going, you know, same with kids, right? If you tell your kids, oh, it's just this way, eventually they're going to be like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's not for me, right? So when we better understand something, we have a better grasp of it and we want to continue. Now we want to actually do it. So this is a two-parter. So today it'll be like 20 minutes and then the next week we'll we'll have the final parts. And I think it's a good time because we're you know right smack down in the middle of uh, the great lent and a good time to kind of reflect of what we're doing all right so the outline part one we want to know where did fasting start where did the idea of fasting start where did the concept come in right who fasted and why even fast why do we do it and part two we go into something called the Orthodox Frenema. And for those of you who don't know, there's a, there's a book actually about this, about, called Thinking Orthodox. It's by Dr. Uh, Eugenia Constantino. Beautiful, beautiful book. The idea, the Orthodox Frenema is the Orthodox thinking, the Orthodox way of thinking, right? And then finally, how do we benefit from fasting slash how do we fast, okay? So with part one, where did it start? This is kind of a... You know, maybe conversation. Where do you guys think fasting started? Historically. Where? The apostles. Okay. Step back further, right? Sure. Let's go. So did Christ, we go back further. The prophets, did they start the fast? We said the Jews, the Old Testament, right? The Jews, the Israelites, right? They fasted. Right? Further. Who? Adam and Eve. Right. Adam and Eve. The first commandment given to man was what? Do not eat of this particular fruit. Right? So the concept of fasting started with God. Right? God created man and gave him one commandment. This was prior to the Ten Commandments, prior to the law, right? So, fasting is the oldest commandment known to mankind, right? Um, his Holiness, which we, uh, we're celebrating his, pa you know, his passing today, uh, all people of all religions on the face of the earth practice fasting. And this is something really, you know, eye-opening, right? Because sometimes we... We narrow it to just, oh, orthodoxy, or just our church. Oh, we fast two-thirds of the year. We're going to fast again. We're going to fast, you know, this, 
This idea of fasting is so ingrained within our church. But all people of all religions on earth practice fasting. Okay? It was a firmly established dogma of mankind. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, we see that God gave that commandment, do not eat from a particular fruit. Okay. I like using pictures because me, it's better for me. All right, so <laughs> uh, if anyone who doesn't know, this is from the movie, The Ten Commandments. So man from the beginning had to practice control over the body. If man, now this is something to just really think about. If man succeeded in this one commandment, it w he would have proved that s the spirit is stronger than the flesh. And we wouldn't be in any of this situation right now if we had just followed that one commandment, right? Because of this, though, the flesh began to dominate man, and then it was almost like a gateway drug to all other sins, right? Um, and all other sins of the flesh. And actually, Paul, St. Paul emphasizes this in Romans. And it's in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. I'm just going to read this for you guys. Um, let's just go through here. I don't know if you guys have your Bibles, but... Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Okay, he condemned sin in the flesh. Can't hear so? Okay, sorry. I, th I feel like I have to just eat it like this, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> this is really awkward for me. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. All right. So, hence, hence the temptation on the mountain, all right? Christ came to restore man to his former state, all right? Since man fell by eating the fruit, submitting to his flesh, Christ began the ministry, right, his own ministry, by overcoming this particular point, okay? And this particular point is control over the flesh or control over food. I mean, uh, this is an understanding as why, why everyone, you know, the question is why food, right? Because food has such a hold of us, right? Who, uh, such a, you know, uh, a way of life. So if we can have control over our flesh through this idea of abstaining, we have control or we show our spirit is stronger than the flesh, okay? So it's obviously why the church starts the great fast with the, the readings. The, you know, we have preparation week and then what's the first you know, technically the first bi uh, Bible reading of the great fast is the temptation on the mountain, right? So who fasted? We already, you guys hinted already, right? We, we know Christ fasted. Christ, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 4, what does he say? And the temptation on the mountain. He says, but he... You know, uh, the tempter, we'll, try, we'll start for verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right. So this is not a new norm. So sometimes you hear a lot of people, Oh, the New Testament, the apostles, you know, they started this concept of... of you know, fasting and, you know, abstaining, but it's not, right? Because what did Christ do at that moment? Christ is actually quoting the scriptures to the devil. So if you go back to Deuteronomy, right, chapter 8, verses 3, I'm going to read this. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your father know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's a direct quote that Christ took from Deuteronomy. Okay? You with me so far? Right. So, and everyone hear me? Right. 
<laughs> All right, so who else fasted? We hinted at it already. The prophets, right? Who are these guys here? All right, we have David, the prophet, and Daniel. Some of my favorites, right? So David, in, his, in the Psalms, you see this all in the Psalms. You, I'm just going to pick a few verses. So I humbled myself with fasting. Psalm 35, verse 13. Right. I'm going to go here. We have Psalm 109. Right? My knees are weak through fasting. My body has become gaunt. Psalm 69. When I humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. Right? Fasting is everywhere. Right? Daniel the prophet, he fasted, correct? He fasted. Because of him fasting, actually, what happened? He was thrown into the lion's den, right? He, he broke the, the law or the decree of the king at that point, and they threw him in the lion's den. But because of fasting, he was also saved from the lion's den, right? Ezekiel, the prophet, Nehemiah, Ezra, Anna, the prophetess. We got the point, right? All of these prophets fasted. Who else fasted? We said the apostles fasted, right? The apostles fasted is the oldest and first established fast of the Christian capitalized underlined church, right? This was prior to denominations, okay? All Christians fasted, all right? AKA every Christian. So it's not just, and this is when we come in, it's not just an Orthodox thing. It's not just a, pro, you know, it's, it's, it's a Christian thing, right? Everyone fasts, right? St. Peter's Revelation, and this is something important for us. We consider ourselves technically what? Gentiles, right? Because technically speaking, within the Old Testament, right, the Jews and the Israelites, they were the chosen people. They were the only people, the chosen ones from the Lord, right, from God. But Christ came and changed that. Christ came, right, and accept, it's, it, everyone's accepted in the church. But Peter, right, had this revelation during fasting to accept the Gentiles into the Christian church. So we wouldn't be a church without fasting, right? So it was given during fasting. And uh, actually, our Peter here hinted at, he was talking about Abuna uh, Gorgios exorcisms, right? Um, this actually came, this, this same idea uh, came up with the apostles. The apostles couldn't take out certain demons, right? And they came to Christ and like, hey, we're, we're doing everything we can. We're, we're following you. We, we did everything correctly. We crossed our T's. We dotted our I's. But what does Christ tell them? In Matthew chapter 17, verses 21, this, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Right? All right, so who fasted? <laughs> who are these people? I actually really like this picture. The Gentiles fasted, but who, who, am I, who am I specifically referring to? We actually, the church sets this up for us, again, in all its wisdom. Before the Great Lent, what do we do? Nineveh, right. So Nineveh, the whole city fasted. Actually, I would, I would go, so it's almost hypocritical. <laughs> I would say Jonah's fast is technically called Nineveh's fast. Right? Jo uh, Jonah's fast, yes. Jonah technically fasted in the belly of the whale three days. You know, it symbolizes uh, Christ in, you know, in the tomb and in the resurrection. But we have to remember the point of that fast was actually Nineveh's fast. Right? Nineveh's the, the city that was saved through fasting. Right? Um, food for thought. <laughs> Clever. Right? So I just want you guys to kind of think this through. I'm not going to answer these, but... Does God provide us with an option, a.k.a. fasting, that's so detrimental to our health, right? Because, again, this is some of the stuff that comes up, right? Oh, you know, I, just, I can't fast because I need the meat, you know? Like, what viewpoint do we use while we're fasting? And should that be changed so we can actually benefit from it? His Holiness Pope Shunuda the third says, those who seek to reduce the periods of fasting are their own witnesses that they derive neither pleasure nor benefit from fasting. I'm going to say that again. Those who seek to reduce the periods of fasting are their own witnesses 
that they derive neither pleasure nor benefit from fasting. Right? Sorry, I'm going to pull up something just to prepare. Uh, okay. Okay, so why fast? Any questions so far? Anything? Uh, keep going. So fasting is a gift, and this is something that we have to start to maybe understand and realize. It's a gift as well as a commandment. Sometimes we separate the two. We just think it's just a commandment. But if we start to realize that it's actually a gift for us, then we start to be more inclined to actually utilize this gift for our benefit, right? If we realize and understand this, then we'll be more inclined and more excited to do it, right? Pope Shunya says, at the end of the Great Lent, you know, we, we go into the Holy 50. And we kind of, you know, I, I hint at it later. We, we kind of, uh, I'll say this as, as, as calmly as I can, right? We break down everything that we built up, right? Because we just dive right back in, right? In the Holy 50, right? But, that's because we didn't really realize the point of the building, right? The point of just abstaining from food, right? So if we realize that in a spiritual level, we can actually keep what we build throughout the Holy 50 and be excited, dare I say, for the Apostles' Fast, right? <laughs> the most skipped fast in, the, in our church, right? Because we're coming right from it and we're like, oh, yeah, oh, we got to fast again. And by the way, this year it's going to be longer, right? Because uh, Easter's coming earlier. So the, the fact that Easter comes earlier, the Apostles' Feast is always when? July 12, right? So it doesn't matter when Easter comes. <laughs> so if Easter comes earlier, that means we're going to be fasting longer, right? But that should be a gift. That should be excitement, right? So to realize it is a gift from God means that we derive then benefits from it. If we realize it's a gift, like if you give someone a gift, there's a beneficial thing for that person, right? You're not just giving them a, a, a commandment. Right? <laughs> You're giving them a gift, right? You give your kids a gift, they're going to derive some pleasure from it, right? They're going to play with their toys, right? So God created us with body and spirit. Thus, he knows we need fasting for our spiritual growth and ultimately our eternal life. So he allowed us to know it and to allowed us to practice it. Paul, St. Paul mentions this relationship of body and spirit to the Corinthians. I'll give you a little, like, just background of the Corinthians. The Corinthians, it, by the way, if it weren't for the Corinthians, we wouldn't have a lot from, uh, I mean, if you guys ever read the Corinthians, you know, there's a chapter on love, there's a chapter on, you know, what we do with our body, with we, what's the relationship between body and spirit, which we're hinting here and now. So they, they were really uh, a rowdy, a rowdy church, right? A rowdy people. And Paul really had to bring them down, right? Paul's like, hey, yeah, like, we need to talk, okay? So he wrote those two letters, first and second Corinthians. And Corinth, they thought they were like, you know what, you know, we're so Christian, you know, what we do with our body doesn't matter, right? It's what we do with our spirit. Our spirit and body are separated, right? But Paul came to kind of explain that, no, the body and the spirit are connected together, right? They're one. Our bodies, right, your body, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So both body and spirit are one, and what we do with our bodies, a.k.a. fasting, a.k.a. anything else, right, it's... It, affects our spirit. It's a connection to our spirit, okay? Hence why Christ came down with his body to fast, to die, to resurrect. If the body didn't mean anything, then Christ wouldn't have done that. Does that make sense, right? It negates everything that happened. So fasting, why we fast also? It precedes all grace. Every gift we get is given during a period of fasting. Notice that we receive every blessing and grace from God through fasting, right? Through fasting, we are primed and ready in a spiritual state, we kind of set our bodies, right? Prepare it to receive this blessing. What leads up to the blessings of the feast? Right now we're getting up to, right? Easter, Holy Week. But what are we leading up how are we leading up to it? Is fasting. Today, when we took communion, 
How do we lead up to communion? Through fasting, right? When a priest gets ordained, how does he lead up to his ministry? Through fasting, right? And same with the bishop, right? And same with everything. Everything in our church, what do we always do? We fast and we pray. Okay. God intervenes through fasting. We see this again in the Old Testament with Nineveh, with Daniel, with Elijah. We see this also in the New Testament through prayer and fasting, which casts out demons. We see it during the infancy of the church. Um, I don't know if you, know, you guys know, but the, the heresy of Arius, during that time, that was a hundred-year heresy, by the way. A lot of people don't realize it wasn't just like a, a one-time thing. Right? It was just like a little, his little heresy lasted a hundred years. And the church fought it through prayer and fasting. That's the only way that they were able to defeat Arianism and defeat this concept um, of this heresy. Because of this, and this is what I was trying to find, um, our church has the Lenten fraction. We didn't pray today because it was a Feast of the Cross, but we express our firm belief that fasting and prayer solves all problems, right? Fasting and prayer are those with which the prophets pursued. Fasting and prayer are those with which save Daniel from the lion's den. Fasting and prayer, right? Every week we pray that fasting and prayer solves problems. Our church, again, in its, all its glory and all its beauty, it, it yeah. understands this. Uh, I don't know if you know this. I'm, I'm, a, so, uh, so I'm a psychiatrist. And there's, there's, uh, you're looking at this and you see all of this evidence, right? That fasting and prayer fixes all this stuff, right? It has to be some truth. We saw it in the Old Testament, the New Testament. We saw in many, many different examples. There's no such thing as a mass psychosis, right? There's no such thing as this idea that everyone has a shared delusion, right? That hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have this same shared delusion, right? So, um, it, again, my point is it's, there's no such thing. This is truth, right? And it's something that we should be very, you know, adamant about especially nowadays right where truth is very malleable right so truth is truth period right no malleability you know um so pope shenouda again I, I i just love him i love his quotes right so he who trusts in his own power and intelligence depends on his own power and intelligence but he who is conscious of his weakness resorts to god in his problems through fasting this is, I, I'm getting goosebumps, right? Because this is really scary because, I mean, do you trust your own power and intelligence? Because I don't, right? I don't trust myself. I don't, I, you know, our, our, my logic is flawed. You know, we're just flawed human beings, right? So if I trust in myself, then that means I have to trust in myself, period, right? You have to depend on yourself. But if I trust in God through my actions, that means I submit and usually uh, we have maybe difficulty with that word submit in the Bible. A lot of times, oh, you know, wives submit to your husband, right? We, we, a lot of people like quote that. But I want you to maybe think about it this way. Replace the word submit with trust, right? It's a whole different meaning, right? Because that's what is the goal. That's the key. You know, you're trusting, meaning you're s submitting your will to God. Right? So, why fast? Again, um, Pope Shunun actually like, emphasizes this point. Um, layman's, which is us, versus ascetics, uh, which are the monks, right? As laymen, we go from one opposite extreme to the other, fasting, then eating whatever we want. We discipline ourselves from food, then we gorge ourselves. Then we just like, you know, <laughs> the next day we're just like, right like or we're sitting here in easter you know sometimes i don't know if it happens here but some, you, you you smell the cooking coming from the kitchen you know it's seeping through and you're like oh my gosh the kofta and wow like but we abstain and then we become lenient right we build up and then we destroy but if we understand again what the fasting is and why we fast when we fast what we do is we train ourselves in self-control all right the point of the fast is to control ourselves. It's a way that we learn, and it's a way of life, okay? And this is what I'm hinting at when we talk about the ortho orthodox frenema. The orthodox thinking is not just thought, 
right? It's how we live. It's a way of life, right? We carry this way of life from our fasting days to our non-fasting days, despite the difference in food that we eat. So when we stop fasting, that yeah. thinking shouldn't stop, right? That control shouldn't stop. You may, you, know, you may eat whatever you want, that's fine, but like the thinking is what we're benefiting, what we're inheriting from that fast should continue on, right? This then transforms our fast then from a punishment, right? Or a chore, let's uh, be less, um, less subtle, <laughs> to a form of grace, all right? The ascetics and monks fast as a way of life. So that's the difference. That's what Pope Shunil was trying to tell us, right? And that's it. That's it for, for part one. Now, when we go into part two, we think, we, we start to understand, like, what is, what is the way of thinking? What's the orthodox forenema? And then, how do we fast, right? Because there's a, there's a technique, right? It's not just, uh, you know, again, another food for thought, um, I don't know if anyone has any like Catholic friends or anything like that, but there's one thing, one thing that I actually really, really love about um, Catholicism that they do uh, during Lent. They, they, don't, they don't do the uh, you know, non-dairy, non-vegan, whatever, but I don't know if you guys know this, but they, they, they pick something they really, 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 really love, right? And they don't partake of it for the entirety of the Lent, right? So... Um, you know, like where, whether it be Coke, whatever, you, whatever, you know, or an action or TV or, you know, they, they really discipline um, themselves to just, hey, like, uh, I'm not going to use this for X amount of time for during the Lent. And it's just something maybe we can take and kind of apply within our own lives, you know, take the good of that. But yeah, um, any questions, any concerns? I, mean, I apologize. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We'll go into that in the second part. Yes. Yes. That's exactly why fast and how we fast. What What is the idea of like? you know, non-vegan. Why is it non-vegan? Why is it every little, you know, but I want to say something, I guess, just to hint it. We have to be careful, and this is kind of, I'll, I'll go into this with the orthodox thinking, okay? Because we confuse the orthodox thinking with tradition, okay? With this whole hard, like, it's almost, uh, God forgive me, it's almost Pharisee-like, you know, where we're following the law, right? Because that's what the Pharisees did. They followed the law to the point where they, had Christ there and couldn't see him, right? But that's not the orthodox thinking, right? Now, we, maybe we present it that way because we don't understand the orthodox thinking. Does that make sense? So we need to understand what orthodoxy is, right? And what is our thinking exactly? What is our way of life before we harp on the traditions and, the, you know, let me read, oh, it has egg white and whey, uh, you know. But also, also, just to be careful with this, okay, we can't skew that other way either, okay? So we, can't, we have to be balanced. We can't be like, oh, I'm going to in and out, in and out burger. God's not going to judge me. You know, like, does that make sense? We can't use that as an excuse to do, you know what I mean, to do whatever we want, right? So it's this balance, and that's the, or again, that's the idea of orthodoxy, right? I, I hope that made sense, but yeah. Um, but I, I get you, and that's actually a, a problem, and that's why we sometimes lose a lot of people within you know that thought process, you know, because it's like, oh, this is too that's that's way too rigid for me. You get what I mean? But I argue that orthodoxy is actually the most unrigid, <laughs> and and we'll we'll talk about that, right? Okay. Cool. That's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Glory be to God forever. Amen. I don't know if Peter wants to do anything.